So in this video, we're going to cover casein hydrolysis, and we're going to start by talking about day one, which is the setup day, and this is activity 5-16. So for our casein hydrolysis, this test would be done in pairs, and the setup for this is actually very similar to the starch hydrolysis test. And so the way that this works is that you would take what's called a skim milk auger, so this media is called skim milk auger. And on the bottom side of the plate, you would divide, draw a line to divide your plate in half. And on one side, you're gonna label BC. And on the other side, you're gonna label EC. And so once you label your plate, then using your aseptic technique, you would use a loop and you would pick up some of the BC, which is Bacillus serious, B serious, and you would, using your aseptic technique, one broad streak down the plate. You would flame your loop, right? Let it cool, go in, pick up some E. coli. One broad streak of E. coli on the plate, flame your loop, then you'd be done. You would take your plate, put the lid on it, and then put it in the incubator, auger side up. And so this is our very simple setup for our casein hydrolysis test. Again, this is very similar to what was done for the starch hydrolysis. And so here's a video to show you what that looks like. So in this experiment, we are going to do a casein hydrolysis test. And so the purpose of this test is to determine if bacteria can metabolize casein. Casein is a big bulky milk protein. And so what we have for this experiment is that we have what's called a skim milk auger plate. And so you'll notice that this auger is cloudy white, and that's because that casein protein is intact. So you can see that my casein protein is intact. And what I did is I went ahead and I labeled my plate. I labeled it with my initials, my lab section, the date, and then I labeled two organisms. So I have BC, this is gonna be B serious, and this is gonna be E. coli. And so notice I drew a line down the middle, to divide my plate in half. The way this is gonna be inoculated is just like it would for a starch hydrolysis. It's one broad streak for each organism. And so our bacteria is in a broth to start. So I'm gonna put my plate by my Bunsen burner because again, the Bunsen burner is my sterile field. So I'm gonna put that there. Notice for the bacteria that the bacteria is settled on the bottom. You can see that it's all at the bottom. So before I even begin, I'm going to start to vortex, and you can see it's starting to move. I want it to be all distributed. And I'm going to do the same thing with my E. coli. Same thing, it's going to be settled on the bottom, so I need the vortex to mix. I will vortex again when I go into the tube but I like to vortex before I even begin while I have nothing in my hands so that I can vortex more vigorously. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my loop. So here's my loop and I'm going to flame sterilize starting at the base, working towards the tip. Again, I'm in the inner cone because that's the hard, hottest part of the flame. So I'm going to let my loop cool. I keep it by my flame so that again, it's going to stay sterile because around my flame is my sterile field. So I'm going to let that cool. While I do, I'm going to re-vortex to mix and then take the cap, flame it, Go in and pick up the bacteria, flame it, cap back on. Now, I'm done with this one. I'm ready to flip my plate over. BC is right here, so I need to keep track of that. It's on this side of the plate. And so I'm just gonna open it like a clamshell, one broad streak down. And then I'm gonna flame my loop. So again, it's just one broad streak. I want my loop really flat and I pull. So I'm done with B-serious, but now I need to do this with E. coli. 
So while my loop is cooling, I'm going to vortex. Okay, cat between my pinky and ring finger, blame it. Go in, pick up some of the bacteria. I went to the bottom because there is still some settled. I'm done with that. One broad streak on the other part of my plate. So there's my broad streak. And then I'm going to flame sterilize. And now I have my skim milk auger that is inoculated with my two bacteria. I'm going to put them in the incubator, auger side up. And then next time I'm going to look at my plate to see if the casein was hydrolyzed, if the milk was broken down. So now we're going to look at day two of our casein hydrolysis and talk about our readout. So the purpose of our casein hydrolysis test is to determine whether bacteria can hydrolyze casein. And so casein is a big bulky milk protein. It's what will make the milk cloudy white. So in our recipe, in our media, the name of the media for this test is called our skim milk auger. And so the name of the media is skim milk auger. And so let's go through and talk about what are the ingredients that are in the media. So the first ingredient that's in there is the pancreatic digest of casein. Now, pancreatic digest of casein. Notice that this is the digested casein. This is not intact casein. This is not our substrate. It's not our source of casein because this casein is already partially digested. So pancreatic digest of casein, these are our peptones, and they are there for general growth. Now, there's a question in your question set, and it says, why is an intact protein, instead of peptones, not usually included in the microbiolo microbiology media? So it's asking us, why are we always using these peptones? Why are we using pancreatic digest of casein versus using an intact protein? And the answer is, is if you think about a protein, proteins are big and bulky. Are they likely going to get into the cell? And the answer is no. Big, bulky proteins are not going to get into the cell. So when we give bacteria peptones, they are already partially digested. Those proteins are broken down into smaller pieces, and the smaller pieces, those peptones, are going to be transported into the cell. And so that makes it so that it's there just as food for general growth. If you're talking about an intact protein, well, many intact proteins are not going to be able to get into the cell. So if we only gave them intact protein, if bacteria did not have an enzyme to break down that protein first, then those peptones would never get in. So if we're going to use the peptones as food for general growth, they have to be the partially digested proteins. Because again, the intact proteins are too big, bulky, they're not going to get into the cell. So we have to give them the peptones because those molecules are smaller, which allows it to get into the cell. And so the peptones are there for general growth. Yeast extract, also there for general growth. Non-fat milk, this is going to be our source of casein. This is our substrate. So the non-fat milk is what's going to contain that casein protein. That is our substrate because that casein is still intact. Glucose is there as just added nutrients for growth. So again, it's just to help stimulate growth on the skim milk auger. And so this is these are the ingredients that are found in a skim milk auger plate. So let's talk about our test. So our test, we have casein. Casein is our substrate, and this is a large, bulky substrate. And again, it's the protein that is found in milk. And when casein is intact, 
the milk starts out cloudy white. So when we look at the auger, the auger has this cloudy white appearance because the casein protein is intact. That big bulky protein is there and the milk has that kind of cloudy appearance. Now notice I said that my substrate is a big bulky protein, right? It's a protein, so add protein to here. It's a large bulky protein substrate. And so if it is a large bulky protein substrate, is it likely that casein, intact casein, can be transported into the cell? And the answer is no. That big bulky protein is not likely going to get in. So what do you think that tells you about casease? Casease is the enzyme that will hydrolyze or break down casein. So would you guess that casease is an endoenzyme or an exoenzyme? And the answer is, is because we have a big bulky protein substrate, casease is going to be an exoenzyme. Bacteria are going to secrete the casein out. So if this is our bacteria growing here, it's going to secrete the casease out. The enzyme is going to be released from the cell. And when it's released from the cell, right, that's the exoenzyme. And it's going to break down the protein into these products. And the products are going to be the amino acids and the polypeptides. Amino acids being the monomers, polypeptides being the shorter pieces of that protein. And so the casease is going to break down that protein into smaller pieces. And then those smaller pieces can be transported into the cell and those amino acids can be used for growth. So what happens to the milk when this breakdown occurs? The milk is gonna go from being cloudy to clear. Because again, when the casein is intact, when that protein is intact, that's why you have this white appearance. However, if the casein is hydrolyzed and broken down, now that casein is no longer there and the casein is what makes the milk cloudy white. And so as a result, you see this clearing around the growth. So clear zones around the growth, that is going to be your positive. So you're gonna write that your positive is a clear zone around the growth. That means that the casein was hydrolyzed, that big bulky protein was no longer intact, and it was broken down. Over here, we can see growth. So this is another organism that was inoculated. But notice that there is no clearing around the growth. The milk around it is still that cloudy white. That's because that milk, that casein, is still intact. So this organism is going to be negative for casein hydrolysis. So positive, clear zone around the growth. Negative, we still have growth because this is our undefined or complex media. So we still have growth in the negative, but the milk is still gonna be intact. So the milk still looks cloudy white. And so that is going to be our negative for casein hydrolysis, meaning that this bacteria on the bottom does not produce casease. It's not able to break down the casein, and that's why the milk does not become clear, and so the milk stays cloudy. So when we did this test, we have two organisms that were inoculated. We have B. cereus, and we have E. coli. And so if you remember back to when we talked about B. cereus. Remember that B. cereus is the organism that causes that food poisoning in rice, right? And so it was also able to do uh, starch hydrolysis. It was also able to hydrolyze starch. In this case, it's also able to hydrolyze casein, milk protein as well. So B. cereus is going to be our positive for casein hydrolysis. So we can see the growth here on the plate and notice that we have this clear zone around it and that clear zone is because B. cereus is going to produce the casease 
and casease is an exoenzyme. And so the casease is going to be released and it's going to break down the casein next to where the bacteria grew. And it's going to break it down into the polypeptides and the amino acids. And then those smaller subunits can be transported into the cell and now they can be used for amino acids for growth. Over here on the right, when we have E. coli, E. coli is going to be negative. You can see that it grew, so here's its growth. However, there's no clearing around it. And so what that tells us is that for this, right, the E. coli does not produce the casease. It does not produce the enzyme. And so the casein is still intact, the substrate is still intact, and the milk appears cloudy white. Now, in this test, there is no pH indicator, and there is no reagent. It's simply a readout of the substrate and the products. The substrate is the casein being intact, which makes the milk cloudy. The products would be when the casein is broken down, and it's making the protein or the polypeptides and the amino acids, when it's making those smaller pieces, then the auger becomes clear. So there is no uh, reagent and there is no pH indicator in this test. It's simply just going to be your substrate, your enzyme, your product, and then what does a positive look like? What does a negative look like? And so this is going to be your casein hydrolysis.